From the vantage point of 2018, it is easy to take for granted the amazing capabilities made possible by advances in material science. High temperature jet engines, lightweight aircraft and ships, satellites, and even high performance body armor would not exist were it not for these advances. The Department of Defense had recognized since the late 50s that new materials would be necessary to develop systems to compete with the Soviets. However, it wasn't until the job was given to a fledgling agency with a charter for innovation that things really got going. And so began a nearly 60-year relationship between DARPA and the material science community. I was a member of a high-level committee, Federal Council for Science and Technology, and we came up with this notion. It's obvious that all kinds of things are being limited by materials, so let's do something about it, set up these research centers. The creation of three interdisciplinary laboratories, IDLs, at Cornell University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Northwestern University was officially announced on July 11, 1960. By providing stable funding for research and equipment and a tolerance of, actually a demand for, an interdisciplinary approach to developing materials, the IDLs were set in motion, and with them the birth of material science and engineering as we know it today. DARPA would go on to create a material science office, which later became today's Defense Sciences Office. The mid to late 80s saw significant developments in computation and microelectronics. Thus, Intelligent Processing of Materials, or IPN, was born. They assembled teams who could invent new types of in-situ sensors that could measure the features of a material during its processing that determined its properties in the eventual application environment. And they combined this with new models that connected the various ways a process could be manipulated to the properties that were sensed. Then they pulled in the control theorists, people who could use the models and the sensors to develop intelligent control systems that drove a process to produce a material with the optimal set of material properties for the DOD application. As IPM took hold in the community, it sowed the seeds for much of what was yet to come in how materials are constructed in the information age. At about the same time, another important application of information was being applied to materials. Solid freeform, now known more broadly as 3D printing or additive manufacturing, began to take shape. Despite the advances made by IPM, solid freeform, and other similar programs, materials processing remained highly empirical requiring significant trial and error at each scale to make a usable part. Systems designers, on the other hand, were taking advantage of new computational tools. This led DARPA to examine ways to exploit technological advances in materials design, and from that came the accelerated insertion of materials program, AIM. Because it, it was really all about managing the uncertainty of the use of a new material. Nobody wants to be the first to use the material because if something might go wrong. But if we could assure them and manage in a robust way the uncertainty, if we could demonstrate, if we could show that it were possible, then a whole bunch of smart people would come back later and make it practical. It opened the door for the what ifs. And what if we could apply this to other material systems, not just metals and composites for structural applications, but membranes for fuel cells, or electrodes for batteries, or materials for, for magnets that have very high energy densities. We're thinking about ways to really invigorate national competitiveness and to enhance manufacturing. Along with the work of the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation, the DARPA AIM program led to a sea change in materials development and ultimately to the discipline of integrated computational materials engineering. I see computational materials engineering as the greatest innovation in materials technology since the Iron Sword of the Hittites. It has really turned the uh, materials enterprise uh, on its head where now theory precedes experiment instead of the other way around. And what that's enabled is a tremendous reduction in the amount of uh, uh, costly and time-consuming experimentation that normally paces the materials development cycle. Having been instrumental in changing the path of material science several times over the last 60 years, DARPA is now working on its next paradigm shift, designing and constructing materials from atoms and scaling them up to yield completely unheard of properties for defense products. 
As we're seeing in the Atoms to Product program, the boundaries between material and machine are blurring as we develop the capability to build machines from smaller and smaller parts, even down to the scale of atoms and molecules. It's probably more accurate to call these sorts of things material systems or metamaterials rather than just materials because the functionality and the material design are completely coupled. Since we are, almost daily, improving our capacity to design and fabricate materials at a finer scale than ever thought possible, it enables us to also envision materials with structural, mechanical, chemical, and electrical functionality starting at the atomic scale. The renaissance in fabrication is already here. We'll soon have the ability to essentially prescribe where every atom and molecule should be located in components ranging from the atomic scale to the human scale. Whether you call it a material or a component, we're moving toward a time when we can fabricate almost anything. And the real future of material science will no longer be how a material is created. It will be how we develop rational and efficient ways to decide what to build.